Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to our Sunday service. I should say welcome to our special Sunday service. Before we begin, I'd like to introduce our special guests. We have Brad and George Takei with us this morning. To offer an oli, I would like to introduce Lehua Matsuoka. Ano ai e na iwi makapola na i kaka mai ne e mu ki ki kawai ki i ke o ke akua e pili mai me he kau no alai kapo hue hue hu no ki aloha o kapili na mau e aloha e aloha e aloha no la e greetings and welcome to all of you who have traveled from far and near to share in the teachings of the Buddha and the universal values of aloha, lokahi, unity, gracefulness, olu olu, ha'a ha'a, humbleness, and ahunui, perseverance. Oli is joyful, to be joyful, to be happy. I would like to share with you a mele or a song about family. It's entitled Mele Ohana.
Mahalo. Mahalo, Lehua. That was beautiful. We will begin our service with the Vandana and Tisarana that will be uh, led by Reverend Blaine Nakasone Sakata. Thank you. You may be seated. We have another treat for you this morning, presenting us with a um, flute. I guess we'd call it song, right? Oh, okay. We have Hari Bayani. The piece I'm about to play was composed by Johann Sebastian Bach and is titled Arioso.
Thank you, Hari. That was beautiful. We'd like to call upon Reverend Yuka Hatsebe, our Chief Minister, to offer us an aspiration. Good morning. I would like to extend my heartfelt welcome and appreciation to Mr. George Takei and Mr. Brad Takei for coming to Hawaii and sharing your message with us today. Also, I would like to welcome all of you who joined this morning service in person as well as via Zoom. My name is Yuika Hasebe and I am currently serving at the Hawaii Vets Inn as Chief Minister. I think I am very a simple person born and raised in a very small country village in Japan. I became a minister and began serving at the Jodo Shinshu Temple in Hawaii. Sometimes I feel life takes us unexpected place and then which we have never imagined. In my whole life, not limited to Hawaii, but as well as in Japan and the mainland US, I wouldn't say that I never experienced discrimination. Sometimes I felt it was very obvious and harsh, but sometimes I felt it more vaguely. Sometimes it was about my gender, and sometimes it was about my race. I was very surprised and felt very hard when I experienced those incidents for the first time because I didn't know being me could be the reason some people blamed me. At the same time, I realized that I may not know anything about other people's suffering and pain. This Honpa Honganji its tradition is Jodo Shinshu, which was established by the founder Shinran Shonin over 800 years ago. The mission statement of Honpa Hongaji Mission of Hawaii is to share the living teachings of Jodo Shinshu Buddhism so that all beings may enjoy lives of harmony, peace, and gratitude. The center Buddha is named Amida Buddha, the Buddha of compassion and of wisdom. Amida Buddha made vows and stated, if when I attain Buddhahood, the humans and devas in my land should not all the, be the color of genuine gold, may I not attain the perfect enlightenment. Gold is a symbol of preciousness. No matter our gender, race, age, rich or poor, healthy or sick. From the view of Amida Buddha, all is precious because Amida Buddha, Amida Buddha's eyes see the true preciousness of life itself. In front of the great compassion, none of us is above or below, but there is simply pure and genuine compassion warmly embracing us. If you can, let us place our hands together and have a moment of serenity and let us together recite three treasures in unison. I go to the Buddha for guidance. I go to the Dharma for guidance. I go to the Sangha for guidance. Namo Amidabha. May Amida Buddha's light always shine upon us and illuminate our path, breaking our darkness of ignorance and then guiding us to true peace. Namo Amida Thank you. Thank you, Sensei. 
There's a short bio of uh, George Takei in your program. So let me add a few tidbits to that. You know, George and I have never met personally, but in the universal cosmos of things, we actually have met. In 2019, Manoa Valley Theater in Hawaii here did the musical Allegiance, which is loosely based on George's family and his experience in the internment camps. George probably would have flown all the way to Hawaii to do the play, but unfortunately he was, uh, or fortunately, he was over in Canada filming uh, a movie. And so he couldn't be here in Hawaii to be part of that show, which then gave me the opportunity <laughs> to play his role in Allegiance. <laughs> so we are connected in the universe. So this is a rare opportunity for you. This is probably one of the few times when uh, you have two Isamu Kimuras <laughs> in the same place at the same time. In addition to all of his on-screen work, he has used his distinctive voice to do voiceover work in hundreds of video games, commercials, films, TV series. Who would ever forget his, oh my. <laughs> He's the author of five books, including his autobiography, To the Stars, his children's picture book, my Lost Freedom, a Japanese-American World War II story will be published this year in April. He was born in Los Angeles, California, received both of his degrees, bachelor's and master's degrees from the University of California at Los Angeles. He remains a powerful voice and one of the country's leading figures in the fight for social justice LGBTQ plus rights and marriage equality. The title of his talk today is What Buddhism Means to Me. Please join me in giving a huge Hompa Honganji Betsuin welcome to Mr. George Take. Thank you very much for that warm welcome and that very friendly introduction by Dennis. <laughs> I am so grateful for everything that's been happening this morning. I was driven here, Brad and I were, by uh, John Matsuoka, and uh, we drove up to the front of the building and I was expecting to see a more traditional Buddhist building. It was astonishing. There was a stupa and elements that uh, did not coincide with my vision of Japanese Buddhist temples. And then we drove around and we got this wonderful welcome from so many of you that were here nice and early, as most Buddhists are. And we walked in to this space that, had, that embraced us with the scent of a, a senko, uh, incense. And I looked up and there's this golden altar, which is the traditional Japanese uh, altar, which my uh, grandparents and my mother had in our homes. And then to be welcomed with all these people here gathered this morning. And then the ceremony began with uh, Ms. Matsuoka's uh, welcoming uh, in uh, the language and the music of the ancient people of this island. Wonderful diversity in the architecture, in the people that greeted me as we walked in, and 
in this, this experience. This column here is Greek modified Corinthian. Infinite diversity surrounded me. That reminded me of the show that uh, I did way more than 50 years ago, almost 60 years ago. That show's message was the diversity of this planet, Earth, spaceship Earth, being uh, depicted or uh, metaphorically depicted by the Starship Enterprise. And the strength of this Starship Enterprise was in its diversity, the diversity of Starship Earth coming together, all in our uniqueness and in our common bond. And we see that here as well in the ceremony here. And then to be introduced by a person that I'd never met, met before until this morning, but with whom we share a deep common love for the character that we played. He called him Isamu Kimura. He was called Sam Kimura, as the Nisei uh, trend was, to take their Japanese name and Americanize it as much as possible. But he was proud of his traditional name and our character, Ojichang, uh, was, we, uh, we called him uh, Isamu, his Japanese name. But we also were Isamu himself when he was younger. And uh, we both open and close the show later in life when Isa Isamu is uh, an old, crotchety, grumpy, angry, lonely man, right? <laughs> So we share all that. Uh, certainly, uh, Dennis and I, but this infinite diversity in infinite combinations here in this temple and in this congregation. I was born into it, uh, a Buddhist family, but there was diversity in my parents as well. My father's family was Zen. My mother's family was, was uh, Shin. And so there was a conflict there. But my grandmother's influence on my mother was very strong. And uh, uh, there, was, there were two temples in downtown Los Angeles, Little Tokyo, uh, Nishihonganji, uh, Shin, uh, uh, Shin uh, uh, Temple, and a little bit further to the east was uh, the Zen Temple. Uh, my father, in his Buddhist ex uh, sense of acceptance, accepted my mother's insistence on Nishihonganji, and the children were sent there. And so I grew up before the war uh, with this very familiar altar and uh, a very different kind of uh, uh, architecture. And the architecture of Vinshonganji was unique too. It had the classical Japanese uh, Buddhist temple ceremonial entrance. However, the architect of that building was a passionate lover of art deco. <laughs> so next to that ceremonial entrance is a row of four Art Deco Egyptian pillars. <laughs> Nowhere in Japan will you find a Buddhist temple quite like the Nishonganji temple. After the war, uh, before we had a car, um, it, it would have been very difficult to go to uh, Sunday school. However, uh, a different church, a temple uh, in the Je uh, Jefferson area provided uh, free transportation to the children for Sunday school. So very practically, my parents accepted that. And uh, we were taken to Sunday school at Senshin Buddhist Temple, those of you who know Los Angeles. Infinite diversity in infinite combinations. 
Star Trek and Buddhist, Buddhism is in, in concert, very much alike there. When Brad entered in my life, he, he comes from Arizona and uh, a uh, non-religious uh, life. And he was very curious about my Buddhism. And so I shared a few things with him. And uh, Br uh, Brad, both in his love for me and in his uh, seeking of uh, some truth in life, accepted Buddhism. So uh, when he uh, does gasho, he does it with complete authority and command and grace. And you would believe him to be a lifelong Buddhist, but it's only for the past some 40 years. <laughs> he is a Buddhist. And one of the stories that I shared uh, with you is a story from uh, my uh, Sunday school at Senshin Buddhist Temple that I heard in uh, Sunday school uh, uh, classes. Our Sunday school teacher was a, a school principal, Roy Nakawatase, with whose family eventually our, be our family became one in a very distant way. Roy Nakawatase's family, uh, a distant member of the Nakawatase family, uh, was someone that um, my brother fell in love with, Jun Nakawatase, who became a Takei. So uh, there's that oneness uh, in our diversity too. Roy Nakawatase explained at one of my classes to envision an immense, vast body of water, huge. And there are many forces that play upon that body of water, an ocean. The heat of the sun, the cool of the wind, the currents, the strong, powerful currents, all work on that body of water to form a wave that rises and rises and gets higher and higher. And at the tip top, when it's at, the, at its highest point, there's a white cap. And he said, we're like that little white cap at the tip of that wave, saying, I am me. I am an individual. I have an identity. I have an ego. But the same forces that form that wave and that white cap continues to work on it, and the wave recedes, and the currents change, and the white cap becomes one. Different pieces of that white cap is sucked into the, the, the force. In the vast oneness of the huge ocean, we are like that white cap here existing for a moment in time. And we share this mor uh, morning together and the forces will continue to work on, on us and we join a huge giant oneness. In oneness, thank you all very much for the gift you have given me. Namo mi dabats. So we have um, a few prepared questions for you, George. I hope that's okay. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, we'll open it up to the audience if anybody has any additional questions they would like to ask. Thank you. First question. What was it like growing up Japanese, American, and gay in an area, in an era, excuse me, when the dominant culture was less than accepting of either? The bombing of Pearl Harbor happened here in Hawaii. It was a horrific bombing. And the terror from that bombing spread throughout the world. 
and here as well. There are people that look just like the people that bombed Pearl Harbor here in Hawaii, Japanese Americans. And immediately you were all subject, subjected to a curfew. You had to be home by eight o'clock in the evening and stay home until six o'clock in the morning. If you were caught roaming around or working at night, you were arrested and thrown into jail. But that was the extent of the impact of Pearl Harbor on Japanese Americans on the island. For the mainland Japanese Americans, it was devastating. I'm sure you were subjected to the same sort of hate. We were looked at, my parents walking down the sidewalk, were looked at with suspicion and fear and outright hatred simply because we happened to look like the people that bombed Pearl Harbor. We had absolutely nothing to do with Pearl Harbor. And yet, they called us horrible names. Some people graffitied our businesses, our homes. My father's car had three ugly letters painted on it in red paint, J-A-P, words of hate. And the government, too, got swept up in the hysteria. They came down with a curfew just like here in Hawaii. We have to be home by 8 and, and not leave home until 6 a.m. Also, when they, uh, my, my parents went to the bank, they discovered that our bank accounts were frozen. Our money was taken away from us. We had done nothing wrong except being who we are. Our money was taken from us. Our businesses were destroyed. We couldn't pay our mortgage, so we didn't pay it. And then on February 19th, 1942, tomorrow is February 19th. 82 years, 83 years since the bombing of Pearl Harbor. Japanese Americans were subjected to what President Roosevelt signed, a bill titled Executive Order 9066 and categorized as enemy alien, which was absolutely irrational. We weren't the enemy and we weren't aliens, and we had to be incarcerated. I remember that morning in May, early in May, my father came into the bedroom I shared with my brother. I was five then, my Henry was four, and we had a baby sister in a cradle in uh, our parents' bedroom. And my father dressed us quickly and told us to wait in the living room. Nothing to do in the wet, uh, wet, uh, living room, so we were standing by the front window looking out at the neighborhood. We saw nothing until suddenly two soldiers carrying rifles with shiny bayonets on them were marching up our driveway. They stomped up the front porch and with their fists began banging on the door. My father answered the door, and at bayonet point, he was ordered to get out, get out of our house. To make a long story short, we were taken from our home on Garnet Street in Los Angeles to a horse stable at Santa Anita Racetrack, forced to sleep in a horse table. I remember my mother mumbling to herself, so degrading, so humiliating. The, 
the place just the stench of raw horse manure was intense. There were insects skidding around on the ground, flies buzzing in the air. Our baby sister immediately got sick, and two days later, I got sick too. We were there for about four or five months. Uh, they, was, they said it was temporary housing, a horse stable for four or five months, put on a train on a journey of three days and two nights to the farthest eastern prison camp, a camp called Camp Roar in southeastern Arkansas. Barbed wire fence, sentry towers with armed guard, searchlight that followed us when I made the night run to the latrine. It was a raw prison camp. Meals in a mess hall, mass showers, mass uh, uh, laundry rooms, a prison camp. A year into imprisonment, the government changed its mind. They realized that they had a wartime manpower shortage, and here were all these young men and women that they could have had. And indeed, they could have had, because right after Pearl Harbor, young Japanese-American men and women rushed to their recruitment centers to volunteer to serve in the US military. This was an act of patriotism, going to the recruitment center to volunteer to serve in the military. This act of patriotism was, was answered with a slap on the face. They were denied military service, categorized as enemy alien. How crazy is that? Enemy alien and imprisoned with the rest of us. But now they needed us. How to justify drafting enemy aliens out of a prison camp for service in the US military? Their solution was as crazy as an imprisonment itself. They came down with a loyalty questionnaire. A loyalty questionnaire after they took everything from us, destroyed our businesses, imprisoned us in first a horse table and then now a black tar paper barrack in a prison camp. They were demanding loyalty. In that loyalty questionnaire were two questions that they absolutely had to have yes answers. Question 27 and question 28. Question 27 asked, are you will willing to serve in the US military on combat duty wherever ordered? On combat duty wherever ordered. This being asked of our parents. They had three very young children. I was six by then. Henry was five. Our baby sister was now a toddler. They were being asked to abandon us in that prison camp and bear arms to defend the country that's holding their children hostage. It was a preposterous demand. They answered that question truthfully, honestly, and with courage. It took a lot of courage to say no, because they meant it. They're not going to leave their children unattended. They didn't, they didn't explain anything about what would happen to them. They answered no. The next question, question 28, was one sentence with two ideas. It asked, Will you swear your loyalty to the United States of America and forswear your loyalty to the Emperor of Japan? The Emperor of Japan were Japanese Americans. We ne never even thought of the Emperor, much less pledge allegiance to the Emperor of Japan. It was offensive. 
for them to assume that we had an inborn racial loyalty to the emperor. So if he answered no, meaning I don't have a loyalty to the emperor, that no carried over to the first part of the very same sentence, will you swear your loyalty to the United States? If you were so sick and tired of this unjust imprisonment and were ready to do anything to get out and answered yes, they bit the bullet and swallowed the ugly, ugly taste and answered yes, then that yes carried over to the second part of the same sentence meant that you were confessing that you had an actually non-existent loyalty to the emperor. It was a completely uh, no-win question. It, you lost with a yes and you lost with a no. And my parents again answered that with a firm, definitive no. And with those two no's, they were categorized as disloyal. How, how dumb are these people? They were incompetents that uh, lodged themselves in the bureaucracy of the military. But with those two no's, they had to be segregated from those that answered yes. And so we had to be transferred to what they designated a segregation camp for disloyals. And the camp in Northern California, right by the Oregon border, was the one that was chosen to be the segregation camp. So again, we were put on a train and made that long three days and two night journey back to California, but to the northern end of the state. And this was an intense, high security segregation camp. There was not, not just one barbed wire fence, but three barbed wire fences. There were machine guns installed in the sentry towers aimed down at us, machine guns. And they had a half a dozen tanks patrolling the perimeter of the camp, the third barbed wire fence. Tanks are vehicles of warfare. They belonged on a battlefield, not rolling around intimidating and anger, intensifying the anger of people that were already ang angry. Tule Lake became a turbulent, explosive prison camp. And we had radicals in the, in the camp, young men who said, you're gonna call us an enemy alien? Well, by gum, we're gonna show you what kind of enemy you have to contend with. Some of these young men were those that rushed to the uh, recruitment center right after Pearl Harbor. The, the government's stupidity had turned them into radicals against the United States. And they said, when the Japanese army lands on continental United States, they're gonna rise up and join them and fight against you. They were the complete opposite of those that answered yes and joined the 442nd Regimental Combat Team made up of uh, Japanese Americans from Hawaii. And the 442nd, in contrast, fought with incredible courage on the battlefields of Europe. They were sent out on the most dangerous missions and they fought with amazing, incredible, astonishing courage and determination. They were absolutely de determined to show who, what kind of people they, that they are. They sustained the highest combat casualty rate of any unit in the military. And when the war ended, the 442nd returned to the United States as the single most decorated unit of the Second World War. They were welcomed back on the White House lawn by President Harry Truman, who said to them, you fought not only the enemy, but prejudice, and you won. And among them were two Hawaii Niseis who became ultimately senators 
Senator Dan Inoue and Senator Spark Matsunaga. This is the background of Japanese Americans on the mainland. It is a shameful chapter of American history. And when I was no longer a child, but a curious teenager, I read many books and I found nothing about the internment of Japanese Americans in those history books. Nothing at all. And so I sat down with my father after dinner in long, intense dinner table conversations. And he was the one that explained to me that ours is a people's democracy. And he often quoted from Abraham Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, that famous portion that goes, ours is a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. He said those are noble ideals, but those noble ideals are where the weakness of American democracy is because it's a people's democracy and people are fallible human beings and they make mistakes and even a great president that he admired greatly, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, uh, particularly dur during the depression in the 30s, when the people were jobless, homeless, hungry, lining up in long lines for a bowl of soup. The spirit of the American people was broken by the, by the uh, depression. And the president had to galvanize the country. And he said to them, you have nothing to fear but fear itself. But when Pearl Harbor was bombed, even that great president became fearful. He realized that the west coast of the United States was just like Pearl Harbor. It was unprepared, vulnerable, open to attack. And he became fearful and he got swept up in the war hysteria that swept uh, uh, over, uh, throughout the country. And he saw people like us all living on the West Coast. And he signed Executive Order 9066. And he ordered us all, American citizens, all into imprisonment. Approximately 125,000 Japanese Americans. Most of them have gone now. I was five years old then. And I'm one of the few survivors of that shameful chapter in American history. And I feel it's my mission to tell that history because it's American history. And Americans must know the fallibility of our democracy and rededicate ourselves to the responsibility that we as American citizens have, a citizen's responsibility to be actively engaged in the process. And he urged all his children to be active, volunteer for things, uh, volunteer and serve. And so I became active in the Junior Red Cross. Uh, I became, uh, uh, whenever there was a hurricane or some horrible event, uh, I was there, there at the Red Cross headquarters packing care uh, packages and so forth. Uh, I became president of a Junior Red Cross in middle school and I was eventually elected student body president. And one uh, Sunday afternoon, he took me downtown to the uh, Adlai Stevenson for President campaign headquarters. And we volunteered there. And I was introduced to electoral politics. And that's how I became an activist. Long-winded answer to your. <laughs> <clears throat> Thank you, George. Thank God, only, there's only two questions. <laughs> 
So let me combine this next one. How did Buddhism help you with your journey in your personal and professional life? And how can Buddhists include, uh, including the Shin Buddhist Sangha here at Hompa Honganji, better support those who are non-white, indigenous, or members of the LGBTQ plus communities? Well, uh, when you talk about Hawaii, I'm not of Hawaii. I'm a visitor here, but the other part I can uh, respond to. Um, we were incarcerated when I was a five-year-old because we were different. Our difference was how we look. That's why the U.S. government put us in these prison camps. But as I was growing up after the camps, when I was about nine or ten years old, I realized that I was different in another way. I was attracted to other boys. Bobby had the cutest smile, I thought. And uh, Richard, and I grew up in a, a Mexican-American neighborhood after uh, uh, our internment. And Bobby was Bobby Corral. He had long, thick lashes and the cutest smile. And Richard Montana was uh, a very athletic kid. But he apparently came from a very poor family because his mother didn't buy new clothes for him. He was always wearing this old, tight T-shirt that, that ran up his body and his midriff showed and the sleeves were pulled up. And when he squatted down to play um, marbles, his pants went down and I saw more of his midriff. And that excited me. But the difference I realized was the other boys didn't react the same way. I was the only one. And I felt very lonely in my difference. And because I, I was reacting differently, and I didn't want to be different again. I was in prison for being different this way. But this was something I could hide. So I pretended like the other boys. And in middle school, when uh, the, our classmate Monica was prematurely blossoming forth in full womanhood, and the boys would get all excited. Wow, Monica's hot. I like Monica. She was nice, <laughs> but why are they getting so excited? Again, I realized I'm different, different again, and I didn't want to be punished. So I faked it, and that's how I realized I was good at faking. I'm an actor. <laughs> and so when somebody said, Monica's hot, I said, yeah. She's hot, <laughs> acting like them. I grew up acting and realized that I wasn't the only one like that. There were other people like me. But I was honing my acting ability and I was getting pretty successful at that. And so I was closeted, the thing that People say gay people who are not out are closeted. We're still closeted. I remember the barbed wire fences. As I was growing up, I saw invisible barbed wire fences for me, keeping me closeted. Safe in a sense, but segregated in another sense, self-segregation. And so I was uh, closeted most of my life. And I saw, you know, I was active, as I said, in other social issues. I became active in the civil rights movement, the African-American movement. I marched with doc uh, Dr. Martin Luther King, and I did a a civil rights musical titled Fly Blackbird. 
and uh, it was during the time of the uh, Vietnam War, and I was active in the peace movement. And by that time, I was pursuing a Hollywood career, and in Hollywood, we had an organization called the Entertainment Industry for Peace and Justice. Jane Fonda and uh, Donald Sutherland, Sutherland were more, some of the more visible people in the IPJ, and I was active in the IPJ as well. Uh, so I was active on all those other issues while hidden, closeted on the most personal issue, issue of who I was. And by that time, Brad had entered into my life, and he was closeted too because he wanted to succeed in his career of journalism. It was another kind of segregation imposed by societal ignorance of what we are like. It wasn't until those brave people like, uh, well, men and women who uh, were uh, gay libera liberation activists that joined in on the struggle for decent, decency toward uh, LGBTQ people that things started to happen. In 2003, Massachusetts got marriage equality from the uh, Supreme Court, the Mass state Supreme Court. And two years later in California, my home state, an extraordinary thing happened in our state legislature. Both houses, the Senate and the Assembly, passed the marriage equality bill. This was a landmark event. In Massachusetts, they got marriage equality via the state uh, courts, the uh, su uh, state Supreme Court. Ours was through the people's representatives the state legislature. We were really excited about that. But it, that bill needed one more signature, that of the governor of the state, who happened to be a, mu a movie star. You know who he was, Arnold Schwarzenegger. And he was a right-wing Republican. When the bill landed on his desk, despite all the campaign rhetoric that he uh, made. He, uh, when he ran for governor, he get, uh, campaigned by saying, I'm from Hollywood. I've worked with gays and lesbians. Some of my friends are gays and lesbians. Leading some LGBTQ people to think that he would be supportive of LGBTQ issues. He was a hypocrite. While he was campaigning like that, he was carrying on right under his wife's nose, Maria Shriver's nose, with the housekeeper. He has an illegitimate child by the housekeeper. And yet, he signed, or he uh, vetoed the marriage equality bill that would have given marriage rights to all people, and certainly to LGBTQ people. I was so angry at him, at his hypocrisy. That's the last the kind of thing that we need in American politics. And I think we all know what hypocrites in politics can, can do. We're living through it right now. Our headlines is full of what the doings of that soiled, corrupt man who wants to be the president again hypocrisy. I am strongly against hypocrisy in the government. And so uh, when uh, Schwarzenegger vetoed the marriage equality bill, I came out for the first time, spoke to the press for the first time as a gay man, and I blasted Arnold Schwarzenegger's hypo hypocrisy. Again, I got long-winded. Sorry.
Thank you very much, George. That's it. Um, I think that's it. <laughs> Thank you. I taught you. I get long-winded. <laughs> Thank you all very much. As we say in Star Trek, live long and prosper. In the, uh, in the interest of time, if you have some questions, I'm sure George would be happy to talk with you afterwards. At this time, uh, if you'll all please rise, we're going to end the service with the Nimbo 2. Thank you. You may be seated. I'd like to call up John Matsuoka now for some closing remarks and announcements. Aloha, everyone. Um, I, I just uh, want to again express my deep gratitude to George and Brad. Um, you know, my own, own family were incarcerated during the war and uh, but to hear him talk and share stories about internment incarceration and lgbtq issues it re really just cuts to the bone and uh, I, I understand it at a level that i i didn't quite understand before so thank you so much um th this was such a there's so many people came together to organize uh, their visit to hawaii and uh, we tried to make sure that we acknowledge everybody, and there's a long list in the program. So in, in lieu of going through that long list, please, please look at it. And it, you know, it, it was a, the, it's great having George and his stories and his celebrity and to bring so many people here to the temple today. Um, but there are reasons for it. And... Um, you know, it's a, it was a, it's been a process in community building, right? Just people and organizations that we had never uh, worked with before came together in, in planning and organizing and contributing to this event. Uh, also, you know, th this is a time in, in this country when LGBTQIA plus members are being ostracized by very conservative denominations. And while that's atrocious, it also presents an opportunity for Buddhism and for an opportunity for us to really express the things that we believe in, the things that we subscribe to. And thirdly, you know, we have these wonderful precepts and values and, um, you know, I would like to see us move those values into the realm of practice and programs and, and uh, services that, that serve uh, disenfranchised communities or oppressed communities. So this idea to have George Sakai come here today was actually born from a conversation that I had with uh, Nikos Labyrinth. This is over a year ago. And he said, we, we really want to do something to, to um, be more visible in the community. And Nikos says to me, why don't you think about bringing George Sakai 
to Hawaii. And I thought, wow, that's kind of a long shot. I mean, I, I, don't, <laughs> I don't know George Takei. <laughs> I mean, I feel like I, I, I've, you know, we all feel probably like we've known him most of our lives. But uh, I don't know how to do that. And so, but uh, this idea popped into my mind. Dennis Sakine. Dennis Sakine played Isamu Kimura. <laughs> and so I talked to Dennis. I said, Dennis, do you know how to get a hold of George Sakine? He says, Maybe I do. So he offered me uh, his email, and, and I wrote, I'm thinking, this is not going to amount to anything. And sure enough, Brad Takei writes back and says, yeah, we're interested. And, and so the rest is history. Um. <laughs> But I have been, we have been planning this for about a year. And I will have to say, I mean, yeah, celebrity aside, uh, they have been wonderful to work with. They have been so accommodating, incredibly generous. Uh, they covered all of their own expenses to be here. And, uh, and that really is a demonstration of their commitment to social justice and commitment to Hongganji. And so I, I'm deeply, deeply grateful to George and Brad for, for being here. And they were, they've been so patient. And, and uh, um, you know, even prior to coming here, they did maybe half dozen interviews with all different kind of media outlets in Hawaii to, to really generate a lot of publicity for this event and tonight's event as well. Uh, anyway, thank you so much to the, uh, George and Brad. Um, we're going to keep our announcements short uh, because we want to we want to go into the social hall. Uh, temples have come together, uh, our own temple, uh, Toban, uh, folks that that are offering refreshments, Moili Ili, uh, Windward, and uh, Chikoen. So we want to thank all of you for coming together and offering refreshments. Again, it's it's really it's been a, a means by which to bring us all together. Um, but let's see, Debbie Kubota wants to say something, uh, would like to say something about the uh, brochure. Thank you so much, John. Thank you for giving me some time today. So I'm Debbie Kubota, the chair of the Commission on Buddhist Education. And I'd like to give you some background on one of the reasons that uh, led to our events with the Takes today. The Commission on Buddhist Education established a project to develop educational brochures on Buddhism and various life events. Because some of our Buddhist youth are in the LGBTQIA community, the Commission wanted them to feel supported and to show that our Honganji embraces everyone based on Amida Buddha's 18th primal vow, which is the perfect expression of his great compassion. I will assure all those saying the Nembutsu and entrusting themselves to the primal vow, birth in the pure land without exception. So there is no one who will ever be excluded from this primal vow. Therefore, the commission's very first brochure is Buddhism and coming out. And if you'd like a brochure, they are available just outside the doors as you exit. I'd like to give a heartfelt mahalo nui loa to the Takeis for being here today, and to John Matsuoka, Rinban Hasebe, and Cindy Alm for making today's amazing events possible. Thank you. Hi, thank you, Carmen. Uh, yesterday, uh, Mrs. Junko Hagio arranged the beautiful altar flowers. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, also, uh, Mr. Albert Wong and Mrs. Lian Wong donated the beautiful heliconia flowers uh, for arranging the altar flowers. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Wong, uh, thank you very much. We would also like to express our mahalo to the AV crew, the reliable AV crew that's here every Sunday. 
And a uh, couple of other announcements. So our Spring Bazaar is March 24th, so please mark your calendar. We will have food and rummage sale and entertainment. And it should be a nice, uh, fun, fun time. And please come with lots of money to spend. <laughs> and uh, finally, on March 15th, we're going to have a huakai, or a field trip to Waianae. And uh, we've, we've got a bus. Uh, we've chartered a bus. There, it holds only 56 people. And I think the word is not even out yet, but we already have over 10 people that have signed up. So if you're interested, please come. We're going to uh, be guided by uh, Kahu Glen Kila, who is uh, from Wainai, many generations. And uh, he was instrumental in getting Hawaiian religion recognized before the United Nations. Also has very strong ties to the Ainu people of Hokkaido. And so we're going to uh, visit about three sites and we'll end up at Wainai Honganji. So if you're interested, please, uh, we have the flyer out and there's a QR code. Uh, I think that's it. Uh, let's see, I, I would like to uh, escort the Takes down to the social hall, so in, instead of maybe mobbing him right away, we want to get them down there, and then uh, if you want to talk story and get autographs and things like that, they're, they're very accommodating. So thank you again for coming.